glad to see you all this morning. This is, um, we've been doing day of prayer. Uh, it's not like the only day we pray all, all semester, but uh, hopefully there's other times that you're praying as well, but focusing on the importance of prayer. I'm going to talk a little bit this morning. I'm only going to talk for a few minutes with a few other things we're going to be doing about not so much the, the, the outcome of prayer, but the posture of prayer. Um, sometimes we focus more on what we expect the outcomes of our prayer to be than what, like, what's really happening in our heart. I read, I read this really inspiring article in the Chimes last week about uh, one of Bible soccer players, Hernan, Hernan, um, who um, was healed, um, had, a, had a kidney injury a year ago or so, and, and um, was expected to go to surgery. And then one day in Sutherland Hall, if you read the article, he was like, like walking through the hallway and this student, she approached him and she said, you know, can I pray over you? And he said it was, it was a bit uncomfortable, a bit awkward because all the classes were letting out, but she was like, like praying like passionately over me and, and he said, and I was healed. Like I got, God he healed me and I don't have to have surgery now. It's just a beautiful story of what God can do. Um, God does the supernatural. Sometimes the supernatural, though, doesn't always look like we expect it to look, either surprised by healing or not. Yesterday, I was in a pickup truck um, driving through New Hampshire. Um, I know it sounds kind of random, but I was with um, a guy who was telling me the story about his brother Greg. His brother Greg was diagnosed with brain cancer a number of years ago, and, and they pulled out the stops, and they started to pray for Greg that the Lord would heal him. And he recounted the, the story about how a few years ago, when, he, when his brother Greg got this diagnosis of terminal brain cancer, how it really rallied God's people to pray. Um, and two years ago, Greg died. And we talked yesterday about how sometimes prayers turn out and maybe in a different way than we hope and that we expect. But he also talked about the powerful way that Christ was glorified through Greg's life and even by Greg's death. The Bible is clear that genuine prayer focuses more on God's holiness and power than maybe our expected outcomes. Nehemiah is this great Old Testament leader who, who models for us like the posture of prayer. He's this, he's, he's this exiled Jew in the citadel of Susa, so hundreds of miles in today what is Babylon from Jerusalem. And, uh, and he's there, and he's kind of elevated because of his integrity to the status as the cupbearer to the king. So it was more than just the wine taster for the king, like checking his food, making sure it wasn't poisoned. But he actually had this prominent role, and he was possibly the number one servant of the land. And um, so it was no small deal, the role he had. And yet this small book couched in the Old Testament is a powerful model for us on prayer. They, actually, the book begins with prayer, and it ends with prayer, and it has lots of models of prayer all through. There are like these short prayers in Nehemiah, these one-liners that he prays during hard times of the day. In chapter 2, he said, I was very much afraid when the king said to me, what do you want? So I prayed to the God of heavens, and then I answered the king. So he sandwiched this short prayer between the king's question and his answer. It couldn't have been more than just a few seconds. In Nehemiah chapter 6, it says, they were all trying to frighten us, the opposition, but I prayed, Lord, strengthen my hands. That's all I said, those four words, Lord, strengthen my hands. And I, I want you to know, like, like, like short prayers are okay. Like long ones are okay too, but short, like in the, in the middle of your day that, and I've actually tried to discipline myself more to do that. Lord, help me with my patience, like curb my anger, cleanse my thoughts, cleanse my desires, just these one line shot up prayers in the middle of the day, which are modeled by Nehemiah. Nehemiah also had these like really long prayers as well. In Nehemiah chapter 9, some people say it's the longest prayer in all of, of, of Scripture. So it's not just the short one line shot up prayers of a, from a genuine heart, but these long prayers as well. And, you know, there are times in our day and in our rhythms of our life where, where longer prayers matter as well. Um, but I just want you to, to end with just how he prays in chapter 1. It says he was in the citadel of Susa, and his brother came, and, 
and his brother told him what a hard time the people were having back in Jerusalem. You know, the walls were knocked down and people were in dis- despondent. And he said, when he heard these things, he said, I sat down and wept for some time. And for many days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then for the next six verses, we have Nehemiah's first prayer of the book. And it's not a prayer of a list of things like, Lord, help the people back in Jerusalem. Help my brother who just gave me this news to travel safely back. Uh, Lord, give me the resources I need. But he begins by praying out of reverence to God. He begins by saying, Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God. And that's, that's how his prayer begins, this kind of this Abba fatherness of his prayer, not rattling off lists, but acknowledging God for who he is. It's that prayer of God's awesomeness and his praise and his worthiness. And then after these words of praise, Nehemiah turns inward and he says, I confess my sin acted wickedly toward you. We've not obeyed your word. We've been unfaithful. Forgive us. So the, 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 the prayer that begins by acknowledging the greatness of God then turns to his own unworthiness, right? It's like David in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore a new spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence, but, but rise me up so that I can restore, have restored to me the day of your salvation. Cleanse me with hyssop, he says, and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be wetted. There's no this prayer of repentance. So this prayer that Nehemiah has, it wasn't rattling off a list. It was God's great, and I'm not. And then he ends with this one request. He says, grant me today success in the presence of of the king. It was a simple request, and this is the anatomy of a prayer. Lord, you are worthy, and I am not, and I submit my needs to you today. Right? This simple, sincere prayer was loosening the roots of Nehemiah's life because God was about to do something like far beyond what Nehemiah could ever have imagined. And if Nehemiah had been so prescriptive in his prayer that it had to turn out a certain way, I think he would have missed what God had for him. I love what Eugene Peterson writes. He says, that's why so many of the old masters counseled caution on prayer. Be slow to pray. This is not an enterprise to be entered into lightly. When we pray, we may have more than an average chance of ending up in a place that we quite definitely never wanted to be. Remember, Nehemiah's prayer wasn't about his wants. It was a prayer that said, Lord, you are worthy, and I am not. I repent of my own stuff, and give me today what I need. It is actually the same anatomy of the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, you're worthy. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right, on earth as it is in heaven. Um, and then then they pray, forgive me my sin. And those who have sinned against me, that going from a prayer of adoration, acknowledging God to my own stuff, acknowledging the junk in my life, and then say, Lord, here's my simple request. Give me today my daily bread. That's Nehemiah's prayer. That's Jesus' prayer. That's the adoration, the repentance, and the petition. And this is how Nehemiah prayed and how we ought to pray. And genuine prayer focuses far less on outcomes than it does in what God is doing in our heart as we focus on his holiness, and on his power. And I can guarantee you that your prayers, when you pray that way, will take you to places you never imagined you would go. And it would be that abundantly, exceedingly above place in your life if you just allow yourself to pray boldly that way. God, you are worthy. I am not. Give me today what I need to make it through this day because I trust you. Biola students, be students who pray with boldness and confidence. And now join me in welcoming our SMU president, um, our brother Liam. Hey guys, thank you for coming here to the day of prayer. Um, I don't know where you guys are all at, whether you're tired, busy, exhausted. I've heard a lot of common themes of that the past few days. Myself, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I'm weary, um, but very grateful that you guys all came out here to pray. That's what it is about. Um, so yeah, a verse that encompasses what today is about a lot, as well as what uh, the Student Missionary Union desires to do is Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8 states, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria 
and to the end of the earth. So today we're going to be spending a little time praying over those four main areas. Uh, I know many of us, maybe from different parts of this country or from the world for that matter, um, but right now in the season of life, we are Biola students. This is our Jerusalem. So we're going to be praying over here. This is our Jerusalem. <laughs> so um, Jerusalem, what is Biola's Jerusalem? La Mirada is our Jerusalem. The people you run into at Walmart or Yogurtland or the neighbor in your dorm, the people sitting right next to you, those people in your Jerusalem, Judea. Right now, Biola's Judea is the state of California. This includes people of Northern California, the Bay Area, politicians in Sacramento, refugees and immigrants who are coming to California, Samaria. Biola's Samaria is America as a whole. This includes the people of all 50 states, uh, the politicians in Washington, D.C., the press minority groups, the people that don't have a voice in this country, the people who are unheard. This includes the various churches scattered across America who are trying to rally up the troops. Um, the ends of the earth, that's pretty self-explanatory. That is, places outside of the United States. This includes the many unreached people groups, the uh, missionaries scattered across the world, other Christians. This also includes people who are fighting against Christianity and hate our faith and who strongly despise us. Of course, I wasn't able to mention everything that uh, fits in these four areas. So if you have something that you want to pray for in a few moments when we pray, feel free to pray for that. Um, these are just a few things that we're focusing on. The reason why we chose to focus on Acts 1-8 is because we feel like it encapsulates a lot of the opportunities that we as students at Biola have to impact this world. Whether that be now or post-graduation, we will always have a Jerusalem, we will always have a Judea, we will always have a Samaria, and there will always be an end of the earth. And we need to be witnesses to these areas in order to remain faithful to the call uh, that w was made in the Great Commission at the end of Matthew to go out and make disciples of all nations. This starts with loving the people next to you, your neighbors, the students around you, the people you run to at the store, the people you interact with when you go home for the holidays, the people you interact with when traveling the country or when you're going abroad. And I, I know that this may be uncomfortable at times, loving your neighbor or loving the people around you, uh, and I understand this, but uh, it may be out of your comfort zone to talk to a stranger, but we have the opportunity now to pray for those things, to to pray for these areas and pray for yourself. So in the next few moments, when you are praying, make sure to pray for your heart, that God will open you and uh, help you understand what it means to be a witness and love thy neighbor. So for today, we're going to be getting into groups of three or four, praying for these areas. On the screen will be prayer prompts to help guide you through the prayer time. There'll be no one telling you to move on to the next thing. So if you're praying for Jerusalem the whole time, feel free to do that. Um, I want to encourage you to take this time to truly be invested in prayer, like Dr. Corey just talked about. This is a very important thing that we need to do, and if you haven't noticed, this country is in a lot of chaos right now, and a lot of stuff's going on, and we need to be praying for this country as well as ourselves and our hearts as Christians more than ever. So I want to encourage you to be present and take this opportunity to be serious. I want to open in prayer. We're going to start the video, and um, y'all going to begin in groups and praying, and then our Vice President Keaton Kerr will come up and close and give a few announcements. So let me open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather as students, as faculty, and staff to, to pray, Lord. Um, these four areas, our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and ends of the earth, are, are important, and you care for everybody in those areas. I thank you, Lord, for this school and the fact that we have the privilege to worship you freely, Lord, and we have the privilege to gather as a body in this gym and pray and spend 15 minutes to just pray. Lord, I pray that you would continue to allow us to open our hearts, to grow, uh, to understand what it means to love, uh, and just show us, Lord, where you want us uh, when it comes to being witnesses in this world. We love you, we thank you, and we give this to you, Lord. In your name, amen. So. Thank you so much for praying. SMU staff, you guys are good to step outside to be handing out the flyers for everybody. You guys are good to go right now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and close this in prayer, so if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity today to set aside um, so much of our time, Lord, to draw close to you in prayer um, as, as we should every day, Lord. And, and I thank you um, for the opportunity to be praying for our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and the ends of the earth, Lord, um, in this day and age, Lord, that feels like there's so much that needs to be prayed for, Lord. Um, but I also pray for the, the hearts and minds of those who are praying um, that they may be changed, Lord, um, as we all look to you for sanctification and to become more like you, Lord. I pray that today may have a blessing over it as we all gather to pray as one university, Lord, um, for, 
for the same thing. We, may we be united um, in our appeals to you, Lord. Um, thank you for hearing our prayers um, and for affecting change through them, Lord. God, we give you the praise today. In your name I pray, amen. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.